And our speaker today is Professor Joseph Lin again. Uh, I can't believe anybody wasn't here for his uh, uh, earlier lecture on messenger RNA vaccines, but uh, let's simply say a lot has come on in the last month since, that, <laughs> since we had that lecture. Uh, and uh, I suspect everyone on this lecture has been vaccinated. Uh, that's a big step forward for all of us. Uh, Professor Lin had his doctorate at UCSF and uh, currently is on the faculty for Sonoma State University. And I don't think it needs any more introduction than that. So will you share your screen and we'll be off and going. Well, thank you for having me back again. It's a pleasure to talk with your group again. Um, and so I, I wanted to basically give you guys a little bit of an update in terms of, you know, I'm sure most of you follow the news. And so talk a little bit about the update on what's happened since the last time I spoke with you uh, and talk a little bit about what some of the outstanding questions still are. And then I thought I'd kind of just finish with, um, with so much kind of uh, news about mRNA vaccines. I might talk a little bit about their application towards other things. Okay, so um, in terms of a, just a little bit of a recap, the whole idea behind vaccinations just simply comes down to the fact that we have um, an immune system that has what we call a memory. And, and the simple idea is simply the first time we see a pathogen, we will develop an immune response to it. But the next time we see that same pathogen, the response is faster and the response is better. And that simply is the reason behind why vaccines work. Because if you look at this kind of cartoon diagram down at the bottom right here, you can see that pretend antigen A is when we get infected with this blue color. And so what happens is that first response typically takes a few days. But once we get a nice response, right, we're gonna, in this case, we're just looking at antibodies being made. You get a nice response. And then once you clear that pathogen, the antibodies go back down. They don't go back down to where they were. You're left behind with this kind of memory population. Now, the memory population just hangs out in your body. But if you see that same pathogen again, then you start at a much higher rate. The response is much, much better. And therefore, typically the idea is that the response is so fast and so good that that pathogen won't make you sick the second time you see it, right? So if we now just simply substitute the first time you see the pathogen with a vaccine, the vaccine is basically there to mimic a pathogen, right? And so now if you see the pathogen in real life for the first time, the vaccine would have mimicked your first response. And now when you see that pathogen in real life, you're basically protected. So this is basically the, the fundamental idea behind vaccines is introducing your immune response to something so that if you actually encounter it in real life, you're gonna already be protected. Now, the, the two major cell types that again are always in the news that you hear about are B cells because these are the cells in your body that make antibodies, right? And that's kind of just shown here, B lymphocytes, they make antibodies. And they're the kind of T cells, right? T cells are these central cells in the immune system that can go around and they will physically kill virally infected cells. And they also help organize the rest of the immune response. So when I talk about memory, what really that means is that antibodies are left behind, but also B cells and T cells are left behind and that you always end up with a higher amount than when you started if you had never seen those things before. Okay? So, that means that when we look at vaccines as a whole, up to the, you know, prior to the coronavirus pandemic, what were typically used as what we call immunogens as a vaccine fell into at least three kind of broad categories. One was what we call an attenuated virus. And this is a virus that's been somehow genetically weakened, right? So uh, for example, uh, a polio vaccine. Somebody took the polio vaccine several decades ago its genetics were altered. And so then when that altered polio virus would infect people, it didn't cause disease, but your immune system would still see it and therefore mount an immune response. So attenuated viruses, again, genetically weakened in some way, so they don't cause disease. So that if you actually encounter the disease causing form of the virus, you have will already seen that 
similar thing. Another category is an inactivated virus. And this is pretty common for things like a flu vaccine where they grow large amounts of the actual virus and then they somehow inactivate it. They're either gonna heat it or they're gonna chemically treat it. And so that by inactivating it, when you introduce this virus into a person, it can't replicate. It's been basically you know, destroyed to the point where it's not gonna cause any pathology. But your immune system still sees parts of that inactivated virus. So your immune system can basically mount an immune response to this, the, the inactivated virus. And the last one here, um, in some uh, vaccines, you could actually take purified proteins from the pathogen. For example, uh, certain strains of uh, bacteria that can cause disease, what they could do is they could simply take some of the proteins from that bacteria and that they would inject that into a person and that that protein was enough to train the immune system that that was one of the hallmarks of uh, that particular bacteria. So these, uh, again, previous to the coronavirus pandemic, these were the three major types of vaccines out there, a genetically weakened one or one that was completely inactivated or just maybe a part, a purified protein from that pathogen. But as you all know, the new platforms that have really been developed in the current coronavirus pandemic, one is this mRNA vaccine, and the other one are these adenovirus vaccines. So the mRNA vaccines, again, Pfizer, Moderna, two of many companies that have developed mRNA vaccines. Um, there are a lot of vaccines still in clinical trials now, apart from the ones that we hear about. And, and some of those other ones in clinical trials are also mRNA vaccines. Uh, the adenovirus vaccines, these are the Johnson Johnson vaccine here in the US. AstraZeneca, this was the Oxford joint venture uh, that primarily is used in the UK and um, in uh, other parts of the world, not in the US yet. And I'll talk briefly about these two new platforms because these were the big steps forward during the, the current um, coronavirus pandemic. So, you know, many people know what DNA is, but RNA is a little bit more of a, a foreign concept. And, and so RNA and mRNA is just being one type of, of RNA. Um, you can think of it as kind of the intermediate that's used by cells in order to kind of carry out the instructions. So again, DNA is in the cell, in the nucleus, and that within the nucleus, the DNA contains all of the information, right? When we talk about the genome, we're talking about all of the information encoded in the DNA. Now, what the cell does is it takes that information and uses it to create RNA. Now, RNA is fairly transiently made, meaning that cells are constantly making RNA and breaking it down. Where DNA is made, and if this cell continues living, that DNA stays there and it doesn't get broken down, right? So DNA is stable for the life of a cell. RNA is constantly being made and broken down. Now the RNA is going to be used to ultimately instruct the cell on making proteins, right? So this is what we call the central dogma, which is DNA is used to make RNA, RNA is then used to make protein. So the protein can then be used in the cell to do all of the different things that cells do. Now, the, the key here is that the DNA in every cell is pretty much the same. So if I take an individual and I look at the DNA in let's say a liver cell, and then I take the DNA uh, from a cell in your lungs, if I look at the DNA, they're gonna basically be identical if it comes from the same person. Now, the difference is the RNA. If I take the RNA from a liver cell and I take the DNA, or sorry, the RNA from a cell from the lung, they will actually have slightly different, what we call expression patterns. And what that means is that the DNA contains all of the information, but not every cell needs to use all of the information. The classic example is something like, um, many of you guys know that, for example, insulin is made in the pancreas, right? That means that the cells in the pancreas are actively making the insulin protein. That means that the insulin gene is in the DNA. Now, that insulin gene is present in every cell in the body, but only the cells in the pancreas are actually making insulin, right? And so that's kind of the, the thought process here that the DNA contains the entire set of instructions, 
Not every cell needs the entire set of instructions. Some cells only use a subset of those instructions and that is carried out through the use of RNA. And that's what we mean by RNA expression, right? If something is expressed, that means that gene is active, but not every gene is active in every cell, okay? So this is how a normal cell functions. And that what a virus does is it actually infects the cell. And in the case of coronavirus, coronaviruses are actually RNA viruses, but viruses can be DNA based or RNA based, doesn't really, matter, but the virus basically gets its genome inside the cell and it utilizes that cell machinery in order to ultimately simply make more viral particles. So the virus, again, somehow gets into the cell, deposits its genome into the cell. The genome is made into viral RNA. You make viral proteins in order to make more viral particles, right? And this is a normal um, process that happens for pretty much any type of virus, this is gonna happen. So the idea behind the mRNA vaccine was simply built around these sort of fundamental ideas. So this is, again, you don't need to see too much of the details here. This is the entire coronavirus genome, right? And you can see each kind of rectangle here simply represents a gene within the coronavirus genome. The coronavirus genome is actually relatively simple, relatively straightforward. There are only 11 genes in the coronavirus genome compared to, you know, like a human being has, the thoughts are around 25,000 genes, right? So coronavirus only has 11 genes, relatively small, relatively simple. And that the mRNA vaccine idea was simply, if we take one gene from the virus and you choose the gene that you think is the immune system might take the most notice of. In this case, it's this S gene. And the S is this spike protein. Again, spike protein gets a lot of play in the news. And that they basically, you can take the S protein and you make the RNA for that S protein. And you can take that RNA and you basically encapsulate it in what we call a lipid nanoparticle. It's basically kind of like a, a, a fatty shell. And then you simply take that kind of raw naked RNA within that lipid complex and you inject it into a person. Now, the goal here is that this thing kind of mimics that normal viral infection, right? Remember I said before that the virus goes in, tries to get its uh, genome in there in order to make more viral particles. Here, instead of the entire genome, you're only using one gene. So you're not gonna get virus produced from this because you're only using a very small part of the genome. But those cells are gonna make the protein, in this case, the S protein, so that your immune system will see it, okay? And that, once that cell takes up the RNA, starts making the um, S protein, your immune system sees it, mounts immune response. So now if you ever see the virus in real life, then you will already have those memory cells that I talked about earlier. Okay. So I put this here because a lot of people are asking, well, how do you make the mRNA? And, and so it's, it's quite an interesting process. I won't get into too much of the detail, but what you do is you make a DNA template just like a cell has a DNA instruction for the cell. We make an artificial piece of DNA and then completely in a test tube, you add the enzymes that are purified to then make the RNA. So this doesn't require cells in a traditional sense, right? You don't use host cells to make the mRNA here. You simply use purified enzymes in a test tube and that once the enzymes see the template, it will just make the mRNA. And so then after some processing and some purification steps, then it's ready to be packaged into these lipid particles and shipped out uh, you know, across the, the world. Okay, so it, the, the limitation is basically this step here in terms of making massive amounts of it. Since you're not utilizing kind of cells in a classic way, you have to get kind of the raw materials purified in order to scale up and make the mRNA. Okay, so the real question is, how do we know if this vaccine works? Well, you know, obviously by now it's been in the news long enough, but um, I thought I'd actually show some data. <clears throat> a lot of times when I give talks to the general public, I don't show a ton of data, but you guys are a pretty well-educated crowd, so I thought I'd show you some data. So here's the, the clinical trial data from the Moderna um, phase three trial. And so how a clinical trial at this scale works is that 
um, in, in this country, it's considered unethical to do what we call a challenge trial, meaning that you can't give someone a vaccine and then purposely try to infect them. That again is not considered ethical here. So what you do is you simply take a large number of people. In this case, the phase three trial was 30,000 or so people. Half of them will get a placebo. Half of them will actually get your vaccine. And then you just set these people free back out into the population and you wait to see who gets sick. Okay, so what this graph is basically showing is day zero is when all of these clinical trial participants got their first injection, right? And then the second arrow is when they got their second injection. And then all you do is you wait and see who gets sick. If somebody feels sick, then they go and they get tested. And if they test positive, then they get, you know, marked as they got positive. And so what you see here is that the participants don't know if they got the actual vaccine or placebo. All they know is they got a shot and they go out into the population. And one of the things you see is that as more and more cases of people in the clinical trial got reported, you could see that the vast majority of the people that reported positive coronavirus were actually in the placebo group. And that in the mRNA group, the people that actually got the vaccine, very, very few of them got um, infected, right? So it's data like this that really um, was then further analyzed and that's where you get your kind of 95% uh, effectiveness. You're looking at the slope of these curves in comparison to each other. And ultimately the numbers will bear out the percentages of people that got infected, how many came from the placebo group and how many came from the mRNA group. And the other one thing I wanted to highlight here was that, remember there was talk about, you know, was one shot good enough? I'll, have, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but here you can see that even after one shot, there is a little bit of difference here, right? So it was clear that one shot probably made a difference, but since this clinical trial was designed for two shots, that's what they ultimately tracked, okay? Okay, so this is the mRNA vaccine idea. Again, you're simply taking a small fragment of the viral genome. You're gonna make it in a lab, in a test tube, purify it, wrap it up in some lipids, which are like fatty-like particles, and then you're gonna inject it and the cells will make it the immune response sees it. Right. The other type was this adenovirus vaccine. And so it's just a similar idea, but here what you do is you take a, a very well-studied, completely harmless virus. Adenoviruses have been studied in, you know, for at least 50 years now. Uh, we know <clears throat> their biology very well. Um, and there are a lot of lab strains that are completely harmless. And so what they do is they take that adenovirus and they insert one of the genes. So again, these companies chose that spike gene. It's the one that's the most accessible on the outside. It's the one that your immune system is probably gonna see the best. And they put that spike gene from the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the adenovirus genetically, right? And now what they do is they grow up this harmless virus that now carries this adenovirus gene and so this virus won't cause disease in people, but it will now have this new antigen, right? This new thing that the immune system sees and it will mount an immune response to it. Okay, so this is a little bit different where you, since these are viral particles, these are actually made in huge bioreactors in a, a, a lab. They purposely infect cells and then they harvest all the virus that comes off of it. They inactivate that virus and they basically um, are used to, to infect uh, people. Okay. So here are the results. Um, the Johnson Johnson trial, we're getting about 72% or so. But here you can see there was quite a bit of variability. And I'll talk a little bit about why there is variability, especially here you can see in the South African region, their clinical trials showed a very, very different efficacy as compared into the US or other parts of the world. Uh, many of you now probably know that that's due to the different variants that are circulating, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. AstraZeneca, again, this was the Oxford Collaborative. Same idea. They both used an adenovirus, different type of adenovirus, but similar idea. And they were getting about 70% uh, effectiveness. But one thing they did notice is that later on in the clinical trials that their, the AstraZeneca vaccine was not really effective against that South African strain. Okay. So... 
you know, I thought I'd take at, at this point, um, you know, last time I spoke to you, there were some questions. And, and since I spoke to you guys, I've given a couple other talks that other common questions have come up. And so I thought I'd take this to kind of answer some of the common questions that typically come up um, about the vaccines. And, and so I just kind of start here. So one of the questions that always comes up, well, why does the Johnson Johnson only require one dose, whereas the Moderna and the Pfizer require two doses? And the answer to this question is really just tied into how the preclinical and clinical trials were designed. And again, I, I thought I'd show you guys some of the clinical trial data because I think, you know, a lot of times people always say, well, the science drives these decisions and that's true, but I think it's sometimes more satisfying to see the actual data. And so I'll kind of walk you through some of the, the data here. So this is one of the figures from the early Johnson Johnson phase uh, one and two trials. So what this figure is showing is that this was the data when they first wanted to see, okay, what kind of dose do we have to give people? Do we need a low dose or do we need a high dose? And so they came up with a dosage and then they basically doubled that dosage. First thing you wanna see in a phase one trial, is this thing safe? What are the side effects? And this is done by a survey. So they give the people the actual vaccine or a placebo, either a low dose or a high dose, right? Or placebo, and then they, wait and then they ask them how do you feel right do you have fatigue do you have headache right muscle pain nausea general pain swelling and that again these people don't know if they got the low dose they don't know if they got the high dose they don't know if they got the placebo and they simply report how they feel and so the color coding the the orange is kind of like really extreme um the blue is yeah yeah it wasn't great the gray is it was noticeable but it wasn't debilitating and one of the things that comes out pretty clearly is that there were more side effects with the higher dosage, okay? You know, low dosage still had some side effects and the placebo is your background. Some people had side effects even though they didn't get a vaccine, right? They got, got a placebo. But this sort of information is really important because it gives you a sense of, you know, is higher always better? Well, let's see what the data then tells you about, does it matter if you use a high dose or a low dose? And that's his. And I know this graph is a little bit overwhelming, but what I want you to look at is this is what they're measuring is basically <clears throat> the immune response. Um, and I won't get into too much of the details, but you can kind of imagine that this is the, the antibody levels, let's say, okay? And what they wanted to do in this was, what happens if we give them a low dose and then a placebo? What if we give people two low doses, right? Instead of just one shot, two shots separated by the 57 days. What happens if we give them a high dose, one shot? What happens if we give two high doses, right? So it's data like this that the, the scientists and the physicians are saying, well, what's the difference between one shot versus two shots? And then what's the difference between a low dose and a high dose? And what you can ultimately see is that here is the one shot low dose and over time. If you give two shots, yeah, it's clearly better, right? If you give one high shot, eh, it's similar, right? If you give two high shot, okay, it's better. But then this is all balanced, remember, with all of these side effects, okay? So it's looking at the data like this that says, okay, is two shots better than one shot? It is, but is it worth it in the context of trying to get people to come back twice? In their eyes, at least for the Johnson & Johnson trials, one shot was good enough and the low dose was good enough compared to the high dose. It wasn't worth the difference in side effects for the high dose to get that marginal increase in their eyes, right? And this HCS is kind of just a point of comparison. This is the levels of people that got naturally infected and cleared the viral infection. So this was their natural level of protective antibodies. So you can kind of see that based on either one dose, two dose at the low range, one dose at the high range, two dose at the high range, they're all fairly comparable. And so at the end of the day, that phase three trial was slated with one dose at the low dosage. So that's, again, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but this is data like this explains why Johnson Johnson only had one dose 
it's tied into the side effects and then what actually happens the difference between one dose and two dose. Okay. Other questions. If I've been vaccinated, can I just go back to normal? Now, the, the key here is that vaccines are not 100% effective, right? And the other key here is that variants can make current vaccines ineffective. And then again, I'd kind of show you some of the data. This was data that came out of the UK. So many of you guys know around that time, November, this is when that UK variant started to surface. And so the overall bars simply are tracking the total number of reported cases. But what you can see is in this kind of like teal color, this is the more or less the original SARS coronavirus strain. And then this kind of reddish pinkish color, this was that new UK variant. So you can see very quickly it was detected. Then all of a sudden it became the predominant strain in the UK. And towards the end, again, it's gonna go up and down depending on the localized outbreaks here or there. But you can see that this strain ultimately took over and displaced a lot of that um, original strain, telling you that this strain is likely much more contagious. It doesn't necessarily mean it's more deadly. It ultimately ended up being that way. But at this point, the data simply says it's presumably more contagious. So tracking variants is absolutely essential and that there are a lot of people, a lot of lab scientists out there tracking variants. And so I just kind of show you this as a snapshot. This is a phylogenetic tree of all the known variants out there. So there are literally thousands of known variants out there. Many of the variants are essentially no different than the parental strain, but they're all tracked. There are global initiatives to track all the variants out there. And each circle here represents a mutation that has been found. So there are literally thousands of different strains out there. But the CDC needs a way to kind of figure out which strains we actually need to worry about. And so they have this kind of classification of, you know, uh, variants of concern. And so the vast majority of these are not even close. Currently, there are only about, I think, four or so variants of concern, um, namely the UK, the South African, many of you guys heard of the Brazil strain, and even the, the California strain made that list, simply because there was evidence that these strains are more infectious. Okay. Okay, will vaccine, the current vaccine still work against new variants? Now, one of the ways I explain this one is when I, when I teach it to students, unfortunately, they don't know what this is. This is a one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater. And most kids these days have never heard that song, so they don't really understand it. But the idea simply is if this is a pathogen, our immune system is made up of a bunch of different cells, but all of these different cells look for different things, right? So here are some immune cells. This guy looks for purple things, right? This guy looks for things with one eye. This guy looks for things with one horn, right? This guy looks for eat people, this thing that fly, right? So if the pathogen changes, meaning there's a variant of this pathogen, if the horn went away, then this immune cell would be non-functional. But all of these other cells could in theory still recognize that variant. Now, the same thing is true for the virus here where we, can pick up mutations of the virus, but as long as those changes are relatively subtle or not too dramatic, then the immune system should still be able to handle it. But the, the problem here is variants will always continually be, be made as long as that virus is still infecting people and circulating. For example, if I had a test tube that contained virus and I put it in the refrigerator, it would not make variants. Variants can only be created if that virus is actively replicating. So it's not really, if you wait long enough variants, if you slow infection rates, you will decrease the abundance of variants out there. So it's really tied into trying to slow infection rates and prevent new infections. And that is the way to prevent new variants from showing up. Okay, and then here's the question, when will we get back to normal? Now, this is again, a little bit of a tougher question because it really depends on what are our, what are our expectations gonna be, right? Do we expect this to be like smallpox and polio where it's basically been completely eradicated, especially here in the US polio. There's a couple, there are two countries still that still have uh, cases of polio, but smallpox has essentially been eradicated from the world. Is that our expectation? Or is it something like, well, essentially eliminated is gonna be like measles where most, you know, people 
don't think about measles, but there are still, depending on the year, a few hundred cases in the US a year, but it's effectively managed through vaccines, right? The vast majority of cases of measles in the US are from people that weren't vaccinated. So measles has essentially been eliminated except in the few populations out there. It's very well controlled, but, or is this gonna be a situation where it's controlled, but we're gonna still have outbreaks and we're gonna to learn to deal with it, right? Is normal gonna be something like the flu? Right. We have a vaccine for it. it's not really, really effective. It's not bad, but we have this kind of expectation that it's going to be around. It will make people sick. There will be a population of people that die from it, but that will be the norm. So that really comes back to when will we get back to normal? What are our expectations really going to be? There are some people that have modeled this in terms of like, okay, we have a massive pandemic now, right? Over time, as more and more people get vaccinated, the numbers will decrease, but there will be variants, right? And it will come in waves and it might end up being something seasonal, right? I'm not saying this is what will happen. This is one hypothesis in terms of modeling data. And that if we actually compare that to, this is data that comes out each year, and this is from the CDC, that looks at flu cases, right? So this kind of wavy line is what we think of as our seasonal flu, right? So the red line here, these are um, basically cases of re viral respiratory diseases, you know, in the uh, kind of orangish down here, these were the deaths associated with it. And so you can see here's a bad flu year, right? Here's a relatively, you know, standard flu year. Here's another standard flu year. And then this is where the coronavirus starts showing up, right? You can see here was that peak um, right there. Here was the kind of later peak. Here was the other peak. These are in weeks, right? So here's kind of 2000, or sorry, 2021 started here. Um, but the issue really comes down to what do we think this is gonna turn into moving forward? And that really kind of answers this question when we, we get back to normal. If the expectation is like smallpox polio where it's gonna get completely eradicated, that's gonna be quite a challenge, right? Is it going to be controlled where we might have occasional outbreaks of flus, but we live with it? That's probably more likely. Um, but again, the, the usage of vaccines, while they don't protect you 100% from getting infected, they are very, very good from um, preventing death and really, really severe illness. And that's really the key, right? The hope is that the vast majority of cases are going to be more comparable with the flu uh, in, in the whole scheme of things, right? If you look at the current numbers pre-vaccine, you know, you were looking at probably a little less than 2%. It's different regionally, but 2% of the people that got coronavirus died from it. Uh, Best guesses for flu were in the 0.1% or even lower than that, right? Again, it was fairly regional. And so if coronavirus became more like the flu, would people be okay with that, right? And those are the big questions that I don't have the answers for, but those are the kind of questions moving forward. What is going to be considered normal? Okay, we'll need a booster. The answer is don't know. We're still tracking Right, Moderna has some data that's out there. So this is data that shows the antibody levels, right? And then what they're showing is um, what happens over time. So here is day 209 from the clinical trials. And you can see that, you know, at this point they're way out there several months out, but we're only as good as what that first clinical trial round has covered, right? And so we haven't even been we're approaching a year now, but this kind of gives you a sense of, you can see it is decreasing from the peak, but will you need a booster? It's hard to say. Most people are thinking probably yes at some point, but it's not really clear. Antibodies are easy to measure. T cell responses are much harder to measure. Um, and that's why everyone always looks at antibodies, but you can see it's definitely decreasing, but where it's gonna end out one year, two years, you know, five years from now, it's really, really hard to predict, but we know definitely at least over the you know 209 days that's been published, it is decreasing a little bit. Okay, okay. So clearly, the mRNA vaccines were a big step forward. 
um, but there are still a lot of vaccines that are needed. Um, the, the, if you look at the list of pathogens out there that don't have a vaccine, um, many of them are actually parasitic diseases. You know, viruses and bacteria we're better at. Parasitic diseases are incredibly difficult, um, partly because most don't rely on the host cell like a traditional virus does. Some are really large, so you can't easily get rid of them by the immune system. And since most of these parasites have relatively large and complex genomes, they have a lot of ways to hide from the immune system. So that's kind of the reasons why parasitic diseases can be really challenging. Um, but mRNA vaccines are clearly a strategy that many companies are developing. These are ones that have made the news. Moderna, obviously here, BioNTech, which is the, the collaborative with the Pfizer vaccine. CureVac is a German company as well as in BioNTech. And they are also creating um, a lot of new viral, or sorry, RNA vaccines. So there are, these three are just an example of a few that we kind of call mRNA specialty companies. Their sole kind of business plan is to really focus on um, mRNA vaccines as their platform going forward. A lot of these big pharma companies have partnered with them. Some of them are starting their own mRNA um, kind of R&D wings simply because they realize that this might be the way forward for a lot of uh, vaccines, simply because they're relatively quick to make. They're adaptable, meaning that as variants come up, you can change your vaccines very quickly to keep up with the variants, um, where some of the older traditional vaccines are much more cumbersome and harder to make, and therefore you can't keep up with the changes as quickly. So Moderna itself is a company centered on mRNA. Obviously, they're in the news because of coronavirus, but they are also in the pipeline for making a new seasonal flu vaccine, right? They are trying to put together an HIV vaccine. Uh, you know, it's been almost 40 years and still no HIV vaccine. There have been, I think, five failed clinical trials for an HIV vaccine. So that's still one of the, the major hurdles for biotech companies in general. But the thing I wanted to kind of finish on is this idea of a cancer vaccine. Now, cancer vaccines make the news um, a lot because it's kind of the, the new idea, but Moderna is also kind of trying to put some, um, some of their efforts into developing a cancer vaccine. Now, kind of before, oops, let me go back here real quick. Before um, I kind of get too much into the cancer vaccine, I want to differentiate some things. We already have vaccines for a couple types of cancer, but these are a few of the rare cancers are actually caused by viruses, right? So HPV, many of you guys know, causes cervical cancer. Their hepatitis B and C actually can cause ultimately liver cancer. The fact that we have vaccines against these viruses is interpreted as, yes, we can prevent these um, types of cancer. But what I mean by cancer vaccine in this context is, can we develop vaccines that prevent against breast cancer, can present, prevent against colon cancer or lung cancer, or cancers that arise spontaneously. They're not caused by um, a pathogen. Okay, so to really understand this, I wanna do a little bit of backtracking and talk about uh, the immune response. So I, I alluded to B cells and T cells a little bit earlier, right? And the key here is that your body is filled with literally billions and billions total, you probably have about 2 trillion B cells and T cells combined in your body. But the interesting thing is that every single B cell and T cell in your body, they create what we call a random specificity, meaning that each B cell kind of in this cartoon diagram will randomly create um, something that will identify a pathogen. It doesn't know what it's gonna create yet. It's all completely done randomly. And this will happen independently in every B cell and every T cell in your body, right? Now, this random creation of things is for future antigens, right? Since this is random, you always have to get rid of things that are accidentally created against what we call self, right? So that means that if you randomly created a specificity that recognized, let's say, insulin in your pancreas, you got to make sure you get rid of that cell. And so that is done through a selection process. So all of these cells are trained to identify something, but it's random. All the cells that recognize what we call self are simply removed. 
because we want to make sure we don't have self-reactive cells. That would lead to things like autoimmune diseases. Okay, so that creates what we call a repertoire of immune cells, and this is essentially what protects us. So when we see a pathogen or when we see a vaccine, it's not that we create new cells, it's simply that pre-existing cells that were created randomly will get activated, proliferate, and then respond. Okay? So this is a big, big distinction here where, again, when we see a pathogen, we're not creating anything new. We're simply drawing from our repertoire that already existed before we even saw that pathogen. But one of the major steps here, like I want to highlight is, again, we remove things that recognize self. Because if we didn't do that, that would lead to autoimmune diseases. Now, how does a cell know, or sorry, how does, how does your immune system know it as cells? In fact, remember I showed you this picture before where DNA to RNA, RNA to protein, that's a normal cell. But what I didn't tell you is that in a normal healthy cell, little pieces of that protein are decorated on the outside of the cell. This is a presentation. So this is a hallmark that this cell is happy, healthy. If an immune cell sees these little pieces of protein, it knows that this cell is normal, okay? So compare that to now the virally infected cell. Here's the virus coming in. Remember we talked about virus making viral proteins. Now the key is this cell will also present little pieces of the virus on there. So the immune cell, in this case a T cell, will see that little foreign thing, right? And it will know that this cell is infected. Normal cells only have what we call self proteins or peptides on there, but a virally infected cell will have foreign things on there. And that's how the immune system knows that this cell is a cell that needs to be basically killed and removed out of the system. But this fundamental mechanism here makes it really challenging for cells to find uh, cancer cells, right? So if we think about this, cancers are created from self, meaning that this idea that this T cell simply recognizes this cell because it has foreign stuff on the outside is great if the virus is foreign, but what happens if this normal cell simply picks up a mutation, but it's essentially still a self cell. And that's the fundamental problem with cancer and cancer vaccines. We know the immune system is really important for preventing cancer because we know that people born with immunodeficiencies or people that go on immunosuppressive drugs, they have higher rates of cancer. That's very clear in animal models as well. So how does that work? You know, so basically since most cancers are self, meaning they're made up of you, they're not some foreign invader, how do immune cells really see them? And that's still a big fundamental research question. We know that immune cells can see what we call a neoantigen or something new, right? It could be due to the mutation that causes the cancer itself, right? It could be something that's not normally expressed in that cell that all of a sudden now is expressed in that cell. For example, maybe a breast cancer cell has some gene turned on that a normal breast cell doesn't have, right? or sometimes it's just a lot more than normal. So you're asking the immune system now not to differentiate between foreign and self, but you're asking the immune system now to differentiate between normal and abnormal. And that's a much more challenging thing. There have been some successes out there in terms of there are certain types of cancer cells that have hallmarks, meaning a lot of prostate cancers, even from different people, might have the same gene expression patterns. But Moderna and other companies now are trying to look at these things called personalized neoantigens. And what they're gonna actually do, and there's some starting um, talk about doing clinical trials, they will actually take a biopsy from a cancer cell. They will sequence this tumor to figure out what some of these neoantigens are, and they will create personalized vaccines for these people where that biopsy came from. That's where companies like Moderna and some of these other mRNA companies are going because then they can create a personalized vaccine that then they can give to someone to ultimately treat that cancer. You can think of in this context, a vaccine is simply training the immune system to go after cancer cells. There's been some limited success. There is one currently FDA approved cancer vaccine for prostate cancer. It's a little bit of a variation on this idea, but it at least has some proof of principle here. Okay.
this is kind of what it looks like. Again, they'll take a biopsy, in this case, a lung. They'll sequence all aspects of that tumor. They're going to find those neoantigens. They're going to develop the vaccine, and then it's going to go back into that same person. This is, again, the promise of personalized medicine with the genome, genomic era. Uh, but again, it's still kind of in its infancy, but there are some kind of early indications that this may work. All right, so then kind of just to summarize the talk, um, the new vaccine platforms, na namely the mRNA and the adenovirus, has shown good efficacy against the SARS-CoV-2. It's been pretty good in terms of um, it's very safe, very effective. They can make it very quickly, as we've seen. Um, it can also be adapted. There are clinical trials out there right now for new versions of the vaccine that specifically go after South African strain. Um, so they're testing those currently. Uh, the biggest unknown is basically how long will the protection last. That clinical trial that started last summer, those trials are supposed to be monitored for uh, two years. So that data should come out, you know, a year from now or so, or a year and a half from now. And that will kind of give us a better indication in terms of will this uh, give long-term protection. Um, and then I kind of finished on the fact that mRNA vaccine platforms may hold a lot of promise for a lot of other diseases. There are lots of companies investing in this technology. Okay, so with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys may have. I mean, great. That was that was excellent. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop you out of sharing so we can see everybody's. Um, uh, and let's see, we're gonna drop the spotlighting. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, okay, first question I've got, uh, I've, I've been following the chat, so there are several questions here. Um, uh, there's been this rumor at times that the vaccine might have a problem of causing a problem of infertility. Um, how, do, how do we address questions like that? Yeah, so there are a couple ways to, to address those sorts of things. One of the ways is you can simply look at the data. In the clinical trials, there were several confirmed pregnancies. There were several um, more kind of retrospective analyses of the clinical trial data that shows that that wasn't the case. The original um, thought that that could occur came from looking at sequence analysis. And so it was purely a hypothetical thing. One of the things you have to be very careful about sequence analysis is that um, it's still all very theoretical. And, and so the only way you can really say, okay, is there an effect on fertility is, is to look at the data and, and all the data that has been published and all the even unpublished data that the um, companies have at least talked about says there doesn't seem to be any effect on fertility. Okay. Um, there has been a discussion about people who have an autoimmune condition um, uh, being a, a problem with these vaccines. Can you address that? Yeah, so autoimmune diseases are one of the, the most challenging things um, to, to really understand well because autoimmune diseases can be very, very different, meaning that we have this broad term as autoimmune disease, but the difference between, let's say, uh, MS versus lupus are very, very different, right? They, they have very, very fundamental uh, differences in their biology. What a lot of people hone in on are, are what are called autoantibodies. And autoantibodies are simply, like I said, antibodies that respond to self. Your body typically does a very, very good job on trying to remove that. You know, when I was talking about how our immune repertoire is generated, I talked about how we get rid of self-reactive cells. Uh, the reality is that's probably an oversimplification. We know that autoantibodies exist in a fairly substantial uh, percentage of the public. Uh, there are regional differences, presumably due to differences in background, uh, ethnic background, genetic background, or whatnot. But there were some studies, so uh, there was a study done um, several years ago now that they simply took a, a, a couple, I think it was about 1,200 uh, people, this was in Germany, and they simply said, okay, these are normal, healthy people. Can we detect autoantibodies in them? And in this particular trial, they got about 30% of these people. Again, the threshold was really low. These were kind of very low threshold autoantibodies, but they could detect them. Now, if you look at multiple studies, 
in normal healthy people, the range is anywhere from 11 to about 40% of people will have very low detectable autoantibodies. But again, they're healthy. Now, even in autoimmune diseases, autoantibodies can be very complicated. For example, in, in lupus, um, we know autoantibodies exist, uh, but the, the question is, doesn't necessarily mean that the antibodies are the drivers of the disease. Uh, maybe a better example is something like type 1 diabetes, where we know there that there are antibodies, but the antibodies aren't necessarily the be-all, end-all of that disease. It's actually the, the T cells in that case that are probably more important. But there are other disease, autoimmune disease, where the antibodies are clearly driving the disease. So that's why autoantibodies as a collective term is very challenging because autoantibody simply means you have an antibody that recognizes something self. But what that self is, is very... Um, you know, varies wildly. Um, so there were some studies that showed that autoantibody levels correlated to people that had the most severe illness from COVID, but it wasn't necessarily clear that that made them susceptible or that's, you know, we saw them in the hospital, therefore they all had this sort of thing. Okay. It, it wasn't as clear in that context. Okay, Lynn, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, so uh, there's been a low level of reporting that there are negative responses to being vaccinated. Okay. Can you sort of reflect for a moment on how much of that might be specific to the messenger RNA or the uh, uh, adenovirus vaccines and how much is just generic to the idea of vaccines and how they're carried and all that stuff? Yeah, you know, and that, that's one of the, the, the reasons good clinical trials must have placebos, right? And, and when I showed you that data that listed some of the side effects, it's clear that even people in the placebo group have side effects. And, and so the question is, okay, what does it really do to? Is it the vaccine itself? Is it the idea that you felt anxious getting a shot that made you feel bad, but it had nothing to do with what was actually in the syringe? Those are the harder things to really tease apart in terms of some of those sides. Now, there were definitely documented cases. I think many of in the news people heard a lot about blood clots, um, especially with the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson. Blood clots weren't detected at any appreciable levels in the mRNA vaccines that I'm aware of. But in the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson, there were some correlative. Um, and even some good evidence out there that there was some rare immune response in a few people that led to blood clots. Um, and, and unfortunately, some of those people did die. But if you look at the actual data and say, okay, what percentage of the people presented um, with blood clots? I think it was about two dozen or so out of the several millions and millions that have been vaccinated you compare that to, you know, those same number of millions, if they had gotten coronavirus, how many of them would have died? We would have been in the thousands, right? And so part of that is that, you know, no medical intervention is without some side effect. The key is always that the benefits are far outweighing any potential danger. What? Mac OS. Uh, okay. Uh, so as the variants occur, we know that Moderna and uh, uh, others are looking at modifying the vaccine to respond to the variant, okay? Can you reflect for a moment on if that is both true and viewed to be necessary, what kind of clinical trial you would say is necessary in order to do that? Yeah, so um, the ability to let's say create a version 2.0 or something like that of, of a vaccine for a variant is, is, is fairly trivial for the biotech company. All they do is they change that template, they make the new form of the mRNA that is in line with the variant, and then they test it. Now, again, we're still in early days in terms of what is the expectation of the clinical trial. And that um, they are currently in phase three clinical trials, especially I think for the South African variant right now. You know, is this going to be required um, every year 
or every time a new variant comes out or can they just create the new vaccine and just go straight into people? You know, that's still not 100% decided. My guess is that they can probably create a vaccine relatively quickly. They might do some quick safety studies, but then they might just go. Because if you think about it, the flu vaccine that we take seasonally does vary year to year sometime. And there's not a massive clinical trial for the new formulations of flu vaccine each year. Um, and so it might follow that model a little bit where there's probably some safety trials done just to make sure it's not behaving oddly in any way. But I don't think you need to enroll you know, 30, 40,000 people to show an efficacy trial just to do a new variant. The um, vaccines that are out were all under emergency approval. Uh, why haven't they moved to normal approval? Yeah, and my guess is that they're still trying to collect data. They probably want to, uh, from what I've heard, uh, the goal is probably maybe sometime this summer, but, you know, I'm, I don't know for sure. That's just kind of rumors that I've heard, but it, it's just collecting more and more data. Um, the more people, the more data they have, they can check, you know, the in the phase three trials, they had, again, 30,000, 40,000 in the Pfizer trial, you know, so 70,000 people is, is a good number, but now we're going to start being into the millions and millions of people, uh, and, and that will get us better data. Because the real reality is they're primarily still concerned about safety, right? To, make, to get full approval, it's really, let's make sure that, you know, everything was great so far. Um, the original mm -hmm. trial was designed for two years. I don't think they'll wait two years for full approval, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, if, we, if we look at the concerns those of us who've been vaccinated have, uh, one of the concerns, if not the top concern, is the variants and the possibility that there will be a variant that will significantly get around the, the functionality of the vaccine. Uh, what should we be looking for in the information that is public, which would cause us to be alerted to the possibility that there's a more serious problem? You know, I think as a person of the general public, it's a little bit harder to follow this until it really makes the news. Uh, you know, I, I think the CDC does have what's called a variant tracker on its website where you can get data um, from a lot of the research groups in the US about the variants. It's not as friendly to the general public because it gets pretty into the weeds. Um, but I think there are some that are more geared to the general. I know the New York Times, if you have subscription, has a variant tracker um, that talks about all the different variants out there. But I think as the general public, all you can really do is rely on, on you know, organizations like the CDC because it's not easy for the general public to really wade through the data. And, and you would hope that the CDC is pretty organized in terms of they list the variants in a kind of a tiered system on which ones they're concerned about versus which ones that they're not really concerned about. Okay, um, I think we're basically uh, almost done with questions. Uh, any left? Professor Lin, thank you again for an outstanding presentation. That was a, much clearer than anything I've been able to gather. Um, and I reminded everybody that we are talking about our next session, September 12th, with uh, Senator uh, Mike McGuire. And have a great summer. And if you have any thoughts on sharing the, either the Zoom or the in-person meetings, please let us know. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you again.